All right, friends, so we've been in Ruth for a couple weeks now. I think this will be our fourth week this Sunday. And finally, the love interest shows up. We told you that this was a love story. And the love interest shows up. In verse 1, we see this man named Boaz. Now, Pastor Aaron did a great job last week leading us through the end of chapter 1, wherein Ruth and Naomi come back to the promised land. Naomi had left the promised land with her husband Elimelech, who died back in verse 3 of chapter 1. And now Naomi, the widow, who also her two sons passed away, is now coming back to the promised land, back to the land of her own people. And the people welcome her with open arms. It's a place where she bared her soul to them. In verse 19 and 20 of chapter 1, we saw that Naomi is opening up her pain it's a, it's a place of safety where she can share her, her heartache with her people, with the congregation. And Pastor Aaron did a great job encouraging us that the, this church ought to be a place where we can really open up with each other, that the pains and griefs and joys we can share with each other and we can be open. And he did a great job setting us up in chapter 1, verse 22, at the very end. They came back to Bethlehem, and it was the beginning of the barley harvest. And he did a great job setting us up for the fact that it's the beginning, yes, of the barley harvest, but it's the beginning of harvests of various kinds. It's the beginning of a harvest for Naomi where she is reuniting herself with God's people. It's a harvest with Ruth. She's connecting with God's people for the first time. This is her first time at church. It's also a harvest of a different kind in chapter 2, verse 1, the beginning of a season of romance between Ruth and this man, Boaz. I'm going to apply this, yes, romantically to that man and that woman's relationship. Chapter 3 is even more pronounced on that. Chapter 4, they end up getting married. Spoiler alert, okay? But what chapter 2 sets up is, is yes, this man providing for this woman that he's interested in. But I think communally it speaks to us that we ought to have eyes towards people's needs, that we ought to play the part of Boaz, looking after people in the community of God that are hurting. We ought to have eyes to see people in the community of faith that have real needs, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and we ought to have eyes towards addressing those needs. So let's begin. Boaz, the rescuer. In chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, we see that this man is introduced. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband. This word kinsman is the word chesed. This, this word means kinsman. It means close relative. It means redeemer. So yes, it's a close relative, but more so, and more importantly, this man is able to rescue her. He's, he's the redeemer, he's the kinsman, the close man that can fix her problem. You remember from back in chapter 1, verse 5, Ruth's husband passed away. And the way that they handled uh, widows at that time was that if a young woman husband died, the husband's close relative would come alongside to uh, grant her children, to take her into his household and provide for her, and to provide an heir for the dead husband. Uh, a man that comes along to, to kind of uh, comfort her and encourage her and marry her. So yes, it's romance, but yes, it's just physical help. There wasn't social security back then. There were no governmental safety nets back then. The safety net was family. And so a close relative like Boaz would come to Ruth, rescue her from her helplessness, and rescue her. Jesus told a story about this. Remember the Sadducees came to Jesus one day. The Sadducees doubted the resurrection. The Sadducees said, oh, all of the miracles of Scripture, that, that's all pretend. And they came to Jesus with a question to ridicule him and his belief in the resurrection. They said to Jesus, all right, Jesus, here's a story. 
A man gets married, and his wife and him are unable to have kids, and he dies. So, according to Scripture, the brother of the dead husband marries the woman, and they don't have kids either. So then the third brother marries her, and then the fourth husband marries her, all the way to the seventh brother marries her, and none of them leave her with a child. And then she dies. In heaven, who is she married to? For she was married to all seven of the brothers. It's like a bad spinoff of that musical, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Here it's one bride for seven brothers. Good grief. And they, they try to trick him with this story because the Bible says this is how we take care of our young widows, that the Redeemer comes along to marry her. And Jesus says, listen, heaven's not like that. In fact, for that woman, if, if she had to marry all of them in heaven, that wouldn't be heaven. That would be hell, wouldn't it? And, and so he says, listen, this is the way it is. In heaven, we don't get married. We're, we're not identified as male, female. There's no romance. There's no intimacy of that nature in heaven. And in fact, you're wrong. There is resurrection. You who don't believe in resurrection, there certainly is resurrection. And in the resurrection, we don't have that kinsman redeemer like Boaz, like Ruth, in this life. So here's the man. He's a close relative. It says the word kinsman, kinsman, this close relative. And so he's a man of great wealth. He's a family related to Elimelech. That's Naomi's husband. And the man's name was Boaz. And so Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears. Gleaning is something, again, that we don't do. So now we're introduced to the second thing that we don't do in America, Ladies, aren't you glad that when your husband dies, you don't have to marry his brother? It's enough I had to marry him, now i got to marry his brother. Like, that's how they provided for widows. And it was important before the invention of Social Security. But here's the second thing, verse 2, gleaning. This is something else we don't do today. Gleaning was this practice where farmers would harvest their, their harvest but the edges of the field, they would leave unharvested. And then poor people would come along and glean the, the leftovers. They would take the leftovers and they would take them home to feed their families. The rich landowners would have their harvest, but they would leave some leftovers for the poor people in the community. This is another way in which they provided for those in need. Now, we do it a little different in America today, don't we? There are safety nets of other kinds today uh, where we do provide for people in need. At my last church, I was in central Delaware, and they do a lot of farming down there, yeah? So we were, our vacation Bible school was Avalanche Ranch, and we needed bales of hay to decorate the sanctuary. And uh, aren't you glad we're not going to bring in bales of hay in, in this beautiful sanctuary? So we had to get bales of hay, in other words. So I drove out to this, this farmer who sa- sold bales of hay, and along the way I noticed that the edges of the cornfields weren't, weren't harvested, and I said to the guy driving with me, what's up with, with all this corn? They harvested it all, but they left the edges. Oh, they're Mennonites, and they leave the, the edges for gleaning. I said, wow, if all the poor people knew about that. I mean, they're keeping the law, but they're not really helping. Like, It'd be one thing to harvest it all and then give some of it to the poor, but all the poor people are having rotted corn because they don't even know that that the fields are ready to be gleaned. Anyway, here's Ruth. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have a source of income, but she needs to eat. Her and her mother-in-law, Naomi, need to eat. So she says in verse 2, let me go to the fields and let me go after the harvesters. Naomi says, go, my daughter, verse 3. So Ruth departed and went and gleaned from the field. And the portion of field that she happened to come to belonged to Boaz. Isn't that beautiful? She happened to come to it. So she's got this close relative, Boaz, who could redeem her, could rescue her. She's got her need of a physical sense. She needs food. She needs to go out and glean. She needs to go out and glean, and she just happens accidentally to come to the place where Boaz is. I love the beauty of God that brings together need providers 
with needers. People that have and people that need and bring, bring them together. As Paul quotes from the Old Testament, so every man had enough. No man had too much. No man was lacking. Right? And God's church is a place where people come together. I need you for this. You need me for that. The third needs us for the other thing. And we could just be together and, and love on each other and pray with each other. It's one thing to pray in your prayer closet. It is important for you to privately, personally pray. And it is good and necessary that you pray for your own needs as well as the needs of others. But the community of God is so beautiful. You don't have to just pray on your own. You can come and you can come at 10 o'clock and walk up to someone with a cup of coffee and say, I'm hurting right now. I just need someone to pray with me. Would you pray with me? And they just get their arm around you and they lift you up in the Lord. Like when you have a need and God has a provider and he brings the two together coincidentally, with God there are no accidents. With God there are no coincidences. With God, he brings the kinsman redeemer, the rescuer, and the woman together accidentally. Accidentally. I love that. The field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. So we're introduced to the rescuer. The rest of the story is how these two nurture this budding romance. It begins with him showing favor towards her. She was working hard in the fields all day long. She was working hard. And Boaz sees that. He identifies that. He gets curious about that. And that's what we see in verses 4 through 7. He comes alongside someone. Hey, who's that cute little girl over there? You know? He nudges somebody. Hey, who is that? Who is that? Let's see it in verse 4. So Boaz came and he blessed all the workers. May the Lord be with you. And all the harvesters said, may the Lord bless you. Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, who is this young woman over here? Right? So he nudges the guy. Hey, who is she? And here's this single rich guy and here's this hardworking young woman. He says, wow, that's the kind of girl I got to have with me. I'm quoting DC Talk there, if you didn't know DC Talk. Well, the servant said, verse 6, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. All right, so we're introduced to her. All right, this is Ruth. She's a Moabitess. And alarm bells might have been ringing. I can't marry outside of God's family. I can't marry someone that's outside of the community of faith. I can't marry an unbeliever. Alarm bells might have been ringing, but for Boaz, they weren't. See, Boaz had already heard back in verse 20 and 21 and 22 of chapter 1. He had already heard the kind of woman that Ruth was. Naomi comes home broken. Naomi comes back bitter. Verse 20 of chapter 1. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Mara. For the Almighty has dwelt, dealt bitterly with me. Well, she's bringing along uh, Ruth along with her. And in verse 22 it says, Naomi returned and with her, Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law. So everyone's coming, greeting Naomi, and here's this Moabitess walking alongside Naomi. Everyone's coming up to Naomi, and everyone, it doesn't say, but we imagine, who's this girl with you? You left us with two sons. You come back with one woman. What, what's, what's happening here? And I'm sure the story was told how back earlier in chapter 1, Ruth says, your people will be my people, verse 12, or verse 13. No, verse uh, 16, I'm sorry. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where I die, where you die, I will die. Where you're buried, I will be buried. And may the Lord do to me worse if I don't keep my promise. And so we're imagining people, people knew, people knew who Ruth was. They knew the kind of woman that Ruth was. They knew the kind of woman that Ruth was committed. Stick with someone. When you join a family, you're with that family. 
You don't only marry the husband, you marry the husband's family. You inherit the family. And when the husband dies, you're still one with the whole family. And so Ruth says, your God will be my God. They knew she was a believer in Yahweh God, the God of the Bible. And so now she's proving, verse 3 of chapter 2, to be a hard worker. And and so this is the young Moabite, chapter 2, verse 6. Boaz is curious. Who is this lady? And the budding romance begins. Wow, he's, he's seeing. He's identifying this is a hard worker. This is a woman that needs rescue. She's that, that widowed young woman, Ruth. And who am I? I? I'm her kinsman. I'm her redeemer. All right, so he gets curious. And then he begins to show favor in verse 8 and following. She asks permission to glean right? She said to me, verse 7, please let me glean and gather after the reapers. And so she did this. She did it from morning until lunchtime, and now she's sitting in the house for a little while, and then after lunch, she's going to go back, right? And verse 8, Boaz says to Ruth, right? He's going to give her favor. Listen carefully, my daughter. Don't go glean in any other field. Furthermore, don't, don't, do not go on from this one. Stay here with my maids. So he's showing her favor. He's saying, this is the field that I want you to stay in. This is the place that I want you to be in. I don't want you to take gleanings from other fields. I want to provide for you. I want to show favor to you. I want to the end of verse 8, protect you. For it says at the end of verse 8, stay here with my maids. Unfortunately, part of the system back then, not institutionally, but but practically speaking, the place was messed up. This was during the period of the judges where everyone did right in their own eyes. No one followed God, and that's why God had brought uh, foreign nations to punish them and famines to punish them. And then they would call out for help and start following God for a time. And during this time period, it was very unsafe for a woman to be out in the field on her own, to be isolated and insulated. And so he says to her, Ruth, stay with my maids. There's protection in numbers. Be close to my maids. And you know what? I'm going to go up to my maids and say, make sure she sticks with you because I don't want her off on her own. I want her protected. What does this say about the church? This says about the church that we need to be Boazes. We need to be someone that has eyes to be curious. Where are the needs in this congregation? This is a job, yes, for the pastor and yes, for the elders, but this is a job for everyone. Boaz wasn't anyone in particular. He becomes someone in particular because of the story and because of the end of chapter four. He becomes somebody His story is remembered because of his character right now. And friends, your legacy will be remembered if you're a Boaz, looking for needs, meeting needs, showing favor to people that are in need. For God says in the book of James, this is pure and undefiled religion, that we care for the widows and the orphans, the strangers and the aliens of whom Ruth is all of the above, right? So it goes on. He shows her favor. Friends, I think what we need to do is look for areas in our community, look for areas within the church, look for individuals in the church that are in need of help. To look over the body of the church and say, this church is a great church, but it needs whatever, fill in the blank. So I'm just going to be quiet for two seconds And I want you to think, this church needs blank. What would you fill in the blank? Maybe you're a Boaz that's going to meet that need. Maybe you're a Boaz that's going to identify the need and fill it. This church needs... Pastor Aaron, one of the greatest things about Pastor Aaron coming on full-time before he starts up at Northern Lehigh is I get to pick that guy's brain every day. So we're here in the building 40 hours a week. I'm, I'm, I'm asking him questions. He's asking me questions. We're talking together. And man, between us and the elders, we've crafted multiple things that this church needs. 
multiple ministries that need to be created. I mean, I would just love to just enumerate five or six of them right now. One of the beautiful things that happened at Northern Lehigh is um, Pastor Aaron and I just started praying for a worship leader. We didn't put it out there. We didn't tell anyone we're going to do that. We just started praying, God, you know what that church is going to need. Would you provide a worship leader? And you know what? One of my friends on Facebook just messaged me a couple days after that. He said, you know what? I've been helping out at my church for 10 years on the worship team, and I just, I really feel called to help out with your church and to be a worship leader at your new church plant. It's like, let's get together, son, because we got to talk. And we met, and, and our brother uh, is going to be starting that, Jason Musselman from our Cedar Crest Church. I'm just so excited about that, guys. That, yes, I could put it out there and tell the whole world what I need, what the church of God needs. Or I could just take it to the Father and pray. And God's going to supply the right person at the right time. So I have like five or six things that this church needs. Looking over the, the kinds of people, the generations, the genders, the, the need for people to get together and to fellowship together. I have a couple ideas. Pastor Aaron and I and the elders have a couple ideas. What do you think? This church needs blank. Maybe you're the Boaz to fill that blank. Maybe you're the Boaz to show favor to that group that's needing, that group that's lacking. Boaz showed favor to Ruth, the one that was desperate and in need. He doesn't merely show her favor. He shows her support towards the end of the chapter. Let me just show you it. He says, I love this. He says to the other workers, listen, when you start harvesting, when you start gleaning all the fields and and harvesting, here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave like obvious breadcrumb trail. No pun intended. They're harvesting grain. Verse 15 and 16, she rose and Boaz commanded the servants He said to his servants, let her glean among the sheaves and do not insult her, even among the sheaves. That is an extraordinary gift. For what would happen was, okay, they would harvest the whole field, they'd leave the edges for the poor folk, and then they'd gather what they harvested into sheaves. They would bundle it together and tie it around. It'd be like the the hourglass When Song of Solomon, when Solomon says to his bride, you are like a heap of wheat. Your belly is like a heap of wheat. And you think, gross, you know, a heap of wheat? Man, that's the original hourglass because you have this this collection of wheat and you get a string and tie it around and it punches the, the, the middle in. And here, this is the sheaves are, we've harvested this, we've stored this. Let her glean even that. Not just the stuff on the perimeter of the field, but even that. And then it goes on, verse 16. And you, servants, purposely pull out for her some of the grain from the bundles. Leave it that she might glean that. And don't rebuke her. He identified the need and met the need full head on. He is like our God who generously supplies our need. God knows exactly what our needs are. I love how Paul says it in Ephesians. He will exceedingly, abundantly do above all that we can ask or imagine. It's not just he's meeting our need. And it's not that just Boaz is giving her food. He's exceedingly, abundantly doing beyond what she came for. And friends, we need to do that for one another. We need to care for each other at that level. We need to be so open with each other that we can call each other at 2 a.m. and share a prayer need. I can't go to sleep. I'm just wrestling through this with God. Would you wrestle with God alongside me? That would be a beautiful thing, friends. And that's what Boaz does for her. He exceedingly abundantly meets her need. And then he says to those who work for him, don't rebuke her. When we come into church and we see someone with a need, it's not like we hold up our nose at that person or point at that person and say, oh, there's someone that's too needy for us. No, guys, we got to be glad that God has 
blessed us to benefit that person. And so verse 17, so she gleaned until evening. And what she beat out was an ephah of barley. Now I know you guys are totally excited. A whole ephah? I can't believe it. That's amazing, an ephah. What's an ephah? I know that's what you're thinking right now, isn't it? Apparently an ephah is half a bushel. All right, so you picture like a, a bushel of peaches or apples. You go over to Lazarus or to Produce Junction and you get like a, a bushel of something. And that's how much she beat out. That's how much uh, she gleaned, an ephah of barley. Now, if you're keeping score, a, a bushel of grain is a lot of grain. And that's a lot. So she exceedingly abundantly was, was benefited the end of verse 18 says, she had leftover and she was satisfied. And so her mother-in-law said to her, verse 19, where did you glean? Where did you work? May the one who took notice of you be blessed. You know, there are some that leave their, their edges of their field for gleaning and they're kind of cheapskates. You know, they might leave four inches to glean or two inches to glean. And this guy did not. He, he said, even the stuff we did gather... We're going to give you a gleaning of that, too. May he be blessed. May God bless the one who took notice of you. What's the man's name? And so she says at the end of verse 19, I worked in the field of the man named Boaz. And Naomi piques her interest. May Boaz be blessed of the Lord, who has not withdrawn this kindness to the living and to the dead. And then Naomi said to her, this man is our relative. He's one of our closest relatives, i.e., he's a redeemer. He can rescue us. He can rescue you, Ruth. Ruth, he can marry you. You can have kids with him. You can have a long legacy with this man, Boaz. Now, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but go to chapter 4, the very end. They do get married. All right, spoiler alert. They do. Verse 17, they had the son, and they named him Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Y'all know David, right? And y'all know David's great, 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 because Boaz is a man of character, and because he rescues this poor widow Ruth, and because he takes her into his house and marries her and has offspring with her, he gets the benefit in the line leading up to Jesus. Friends, when we, through our character, give aid to those in need, we leave a legacy for great generations afterwards. There was a, a story of a man who, um, just a no-name preacher, started preaching at his first church, preached the gospel. And he left the pulpit thinking, man, this sermon was a dud. No one liked it. No one enjoyed it. The gospel went out, but no one received it. And he, in despair, quit the ministry, stopped helping people. But in that room at that time, was a young man named Gordon Fee. And he was not a believer. And through the, pro the proclamation of the good news of Jesus, forgiveness, this young man becomes saved. Never told the preacher, never told anyone, but received the salvation in Jesus' name. And of course, we know what this young man became. Prolific writer, commentator, great man of the church, pastor, instructor, wise man. My friends, we just have to get out there and live. We have to be people of character that come alongside and help and share good news and offer hope. We never know what we'll accomplish until we see God in heaven and he'll whisper in our ear everything that was accomplished because we stepped out in faith and did something hard. Our youth group Friday night did something rather hard. They went to Center City Allentown and they, um, they worked alongside a kid's ministry, uh, a kid's uh, play group, um, and they weren't allowed to share the gospel because the organization gets gov government support. 
and they heard all the, these bangs that sounded like gunshots. And they and all the children ran into the building. They were outside watching a movie under the stars. And they ran into the building. And man, when gunshots fire, and God comes up, will God protect us? And what do you think our teenagers told those little kids? Of course, yes. When you come alongside to help someone, God gives you opportunity. And God gave Boaz opportunity to help Ruth because he's a man of character stepping out in faith to help. And he leaves a legacy for generations to come. Friends, if we would do this, if we would have eyes to see needs and meet those needs, God only knows what could come from you stepping out to do it. This church needs blank. What can and what will God do through you when you step out and say, God has given me the eyes to see this church needs blank, and I am going to fill that need like Boaz filled that need. God only knows what could happen through him working through you, meeting that need like Boaz met Ruth's need. Chapter 2, verse 1, Boaz is the redeemer. His great, 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 great grandson is a redeemer of a whole other kind. Jesus, the great redeemer. Here, Boaz is a lowercase r redeemer. His great, 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 great grandson, because he was a man of character and stepped up in faith and helped Ruth, provided for her, cared for her, supported her, protected her. Because he's a man of character doing that, his great, great, great grandson becomes capital R, redeemer of what? the entire world. And friends, when we step out, the capital R Redeemer follows in our footsteps and he acts because we chose to benefit other people and act. I, I find tremendous rest in that promise, friends. I find tremendous energy to move forward because of that promise. I hope this story and this passion energizes you to go out and to meet people's needs and to fill in the blank and it doesn't remain blank any longer. Be a Boaz, be a Jesus, be a redeemer to someone who needs help, to a whole host of people that need help, to a lacking thing in this congregation or in this community. Be a Jesus, be a capital R redeemer moving forward. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for Boaz, the man who supports and the man who provides for God's community. He saw a need, was curious about a need, met a need, supplied this woman's need continually from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. And Jesus, you talked to us about a harvest of a whole other kind. He said, hey, the harvest is three months from now, but look, look at the people. The harvest is white, ready to be collected in. And God, we look at our community right now and say, God, right now you are ready to save souls, to grow Christians in their faith, to move the Lehigh Valley out of the margins of evangelicalism and to really promote the good news of Jesus throughout this, this very lacking county. God, we identify the need. We're curious about the need. How can it be that in the birthplace of the Bible Fellowship Church, there's less than 6% of this community that is gospel-believing? How can it be that the Bible Fellowship Church has been in this community 150 years, and yet 5.9% of the Lehigh Valley is evangelical? Lord, we see that need. This congregation sees that need. We're moving on that need. We're planting a new church because of that need. And when we want to begin a whole movement, God, of planting churches, we see that need. So the church as a whole sees that big need. And God, right now, your spirit has given your believers little needs. I see this need in the church. I see this need in the community. And we're going to be like Jesus, like his great-grandfather, Boaz, and we're going to fill that need. We're going to identify a problem, and we're going to address that problem. We're going to fix what is broken. We're going to heal who are harmed. The heart that is aching, we're going to comfort it. 
the generation or the people group in this church that doesn't have ministry geared for them, we're going to step up and be that person to fill that need, to care for that group. Lord God, we're going to step up in outreach. This church needs outreach, and we're going to step up. I'm going to step up. I'm going to come up to Pastor Tim today and say, I need to be that person that's going to outreach for this community. God, I just pray that popcorn would just start popping in this room, that as one person bursts forth and stops being a seed and starts being useful, I am going to fill that need. God, we want to celebrate those who've already popped, who've gone before us and are right now filling junior church, right now staffing the nursery, right now working in the sound crew, right now sitting at the organ. God, I praise you for those who've stepped forward to minister, for our Awana workers that are going forth and on break now but moving forward. Those who've talked to Rachel about serving in Vacation Bible School, whether at Whitehall or Northern Lehigh, they're going forward to serve. And God, another popcorn seed needs to pop. Another person needs to pop up out of their seat and say, I will meet this need. I will care for that need. I will be the point person for this issue in the church. I will step up and start a soup kitchen. I will start a food pantry. I will start a counseling group. I will care for souls. I will just be a friend that that doesn't sit in my seat but comes up to people and talks to them and prays with them. I will be this. I will be that. I will be useful because I am God's minister. Oh God, help us to see where we can be busy in your kingdom. And God, we pause and pray right now for that person in this room that doesn't know Christ. They don't know who he is. They don't know what he's done. They hear the name, but they don't know his work. And God, I would just pray that you would show people right now that the church of God is a caring place because Jesus Christ is a caring, compassionate friend. He came to this earth 2,000 years ago to preach and to teach and to heal and to go to the cross and die in our place because we've all done wrong. We've all sinned. And God, I just hope that you would show each one of us where we've gone wrong, what we need fixed. And Jesus, you fixed it. You went to the cross and took the punishment that I deserved, my friend deserved, that unbeliever in this room deserved. He took it. He took it away. He inherited our punishment. And we don't need to be punished for our sin because he was punished. We don't need to die because of our sin because he died. And Jesus said, whoever believes in me will never die. It's nothing we have to do, nothing we have to say, nothing we have to pledge, nothing we have to accomplish. It's everything Jesus accomplished. Whoever believes in me will never die. And friend, maybe right now you're saying, I I don't want to die. I do not want to be punished for my sin. I will gladly have Jesus forgive me. Friend, all you need to do is pray a very basic, simple prayer. Follow me if you're ready. In the quietness of your heart, talk to God. You don't need to use lips. You need to use your heart, your mind. Talk to God. God, I believe that you are. I believe that your son Jesus came to this world to die in my place for my sin. I'm sorry for all that I've done wrong. I've done so much wrong. Please forgive me because Jesus paid for my sin. Please forgive me. Please come into my life and save me from all that I've done. Give me your gift of life eternal. Come into my life. Be my friend. Be ever present. Direct my steps. I don't want to make poor decisions anymore. I want to walk with you, so help me. Friend, if you pray a prayer like that, you become a child of God, you become forgiven of sin. You, be, you become eternal beings, a person that will live on forever. No magic formula, just all belief in Jesus. God, as we go our separate ways into this world, make us useful for you. 
set us on the road to productivity, not in a temporal sense, not in a vocational sense, but in a spiritual sense. Give us time, give us opportunity, give us words to encourage someone. Let us be the Boaz, the Jesus, the Redeemer, the Helper in our generation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.